Thank you very much, Jackie. Good afternoon, everyone. So I am announcing the 2019 Idu Snyder Prize for the Best Scholarly or Nonfiction Work in 2017 and 2018. I'm doing so on behalf of the prize committee, Abu Sede George, Aisha Ibrahim, Heidi Nast, and myself. Our second runner-up was Heather Switzer's When the Light is Fire, Maasai Schoolgirls in Contemporary Kenya, published by the University of Illinois Press in 2018. Our first runner-up was Angela Impey's Song Walking, Women, Music, and Environmental Justice in an African Borderland, published by the University of Chicago Press, also in 2018. Both are excellent and enchanting books to read, and we recommend them. We had nine outstanding books to choose among, and this year's winner is Suad Musa's Hawks and Doves in Sudan's Armed Conflict, al Hakamat Bagara, Women of Darfur. It was published by James Curry, also in 2018. I'd like to invite Dr. Musa to this stage at this point. She is an independent scholar who is attending the ASA and visiting the US for the first time from her home in the UK. And before I turn the microphone over to her, I'd like to say just a few words about the book. Hawks and Doves is an impressive work contributing a complex understanding of the various and sometimes counterintuitive ways in which the categories of women and war may come together in contemporary South Sudan and beyond. Musa presents a clear picture of the history of the Darfur wars and the fluidity of race, gender, ethnicity, and nationalism in those wars. Hawks and Doves problematizes the role of women in conflict, shifting the narrative away from that of women as peacemakers or victims of war. Through her nuanced ethnographic reading of identities, affiliations, nationalism, and the interplay of micro and macro politics, Musa illuminates a very unexpected figure as a player in the mobilization of ethno-nationalist fervor within the nascent nation state, namely the al Hakamat women. Hawks and Doves is an intellectually rigorous, politically challenging, and ethically undertaken work of first-rate feminist Africanist scholarship. And so I have to present to her a monetary award. Oh, thank, you. thank you. As well as a statue that is engraved with her name and the uh, name of the ward, as, as well as the ASA Women's Caucus. Thank Oh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and I hope you enjoy the food. Um, um, I'm so honored to be here tonight, and I'm so grateful to be the recipient of Edu Snyder Book Award Prize for 2019. It, I can't express how grateful I am to have all of you here tonight. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the um, uh, um, ASA Women's Caucus and the Edu Snyder Committee for considering my book for the award in 2019, which is a great honor and privilege. To receive the prize in 2019 is a distinction that I accept with great honor and gratitude, and I will always uh, treasure and cherish so long as I live. This is a momentous event in my professional career, and today is a memorable day in my life. It comes as a complete surprise. It really it was a complete surprise <laughs> for me. And delightful news at a very important juncture in the history of women, politics, and gender power relationship in Sudan following the overthrow of the Muslim Brotherhood dictator regime of al-Bashir on April uh, 2019. Thank you, but I am so grateful to great many wonderful people who helped me along the way. The informants, relatives, friends, colleagues, but I must mention two journalists, Ahmad Jua and Muhammad Saleh Yasin, Imad Hanan and Abdeddin who offered me advice and facilitated my work at a time fraught with precarious security situation in Darfur. My special thanks go to Al-Hakamat, 
who were sincere, enthusiastic, and generous in engaging in, with my research. However, without the help of James Carey, this book wouldn't have been nominated. So my gratitude also goes to Jacqueline Mitchell and the editors, Lynn Taylor and Belinda Kennison and Paul Medekaf, a vocacy advocate, typist who guided me with dexterity and sincerity until the book was published and promoted. To my fellow nominees, I say thank you because my daughter kiddingly doubted that I might have been the only one in the competition. <laughs> and that is because every time she comes home and then she says, oh mom, I come first in the competition. And then I ask her how many were there in the competition. And he would say, oh, so it's only me, mom. Uh, last and uh, not least, my greatest thank you to my astounding supportive family. My husband, Muhammad, for his endless reliable support, selflessness, and magnanimity. And my lovely daughter, Hadia, who makes me smile and laugh when my face grimaces for long while I'm looking for the right translation or transliteration of the transcript. Their support, sympathy, and love are the spiritual power that propelled me to finish this book. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ruth Akra will now present um, the prize for our student, our graduate student travel award. On behalf of Linda Day, the chair, Maria, and I, we thank Jackie and Maha and the Women's Caucus for thrusting us to choose the winner of the 2019 Penny Shred Student Travel Grant. There were many strong applications that made us proud of the work students are doing. The future is bright and we encourage students to apply next year. The winner of 2019 Penny Shred Student Travel Grant is Beth Ann Williams. Can you please come to the stage? Beth is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. She researches gender, social change, community building, and religious practices in modern East Africa. She presented the paper, a wonderful paper, on prayer and vulnerability, exploring Christian women's spirituality and empowerment in 20th century East Africa. Congratulations, Beth. <laughs> okay, so um, we are getting to our lunch lecture. And um, our speaker this year is Patricia McFadden, who I know most of you here are familiar with and you're familiar with her work because she's one of the, she's a prolific scholar, but also one of the most important feminist voices from the continent. What those of us who are familiar with her work love about Patricia is that she is unapologetic about her radical feminism. And what I noticed when Patricia arrived and registered was that her badge said autonomous feminist, which I absolutely love. Um, so Patricia McFadden is a radical African echo feminist who aspires to a life of freedom and joy. She is vegan and produces most of her own organic food on a mountain in Eastern Swatini. She strives towards a balanced respect for relationship with nature as it, it, encompass, as it encompasses all sentient beings. Her most recent publications are, Women's Freedoms Are the Heartbeat of Africa, Future, a Sankarian Imperative. 
in a certain amount of madness, the life, politics, and legacies of Thomas Sankara in 2018, a feminist conversation situating our radical ideas and energies in the contemporary African context and critique conventional discourses on girls and gendered female identities in Africa in 2018, and contemporarity, sufficiency in a radical African feminist life in meridians, feminism, race, and transnationalism in 2018. So please join me in welcoming the incredible Patricia McFadden. Um, so thank you, Maha. <clears throat> it's just really, um, it's wonderful to be here. And um, I'm, I'm seldom uh, kind of uh, thrown, but I do feel overwhelmed <laughs> um, by a, a feeling of, um, of happiness. I'm, I'm just really happy to be able to be part of this community of amazing women and other humans. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, because, <laughs> and because we, we, we have, uh, time is, is a scarce resource and uh, I have a few things that I would like to, to share with you, and I hope that we'll have a few moments when we can uh, talk about them. Mm. So um, let me just start by thanking Maha and her colleagues for inviting me to share this time with you today. I feel tremendously gifted by the privilege and the joy that this sharing of community will allow me to be part of. All of my feminist life, and it's now half a century since, since I took the step into being a radical woman, um, thinking, resisting, and celebrating with my sisters has been an important source of strength and happiness for me. The feminist community has not always been the safest place to be in, given how porous its boundaries are and the vulnerabilities of essentialisms that often lay us bare to intrigues and struggles over power. These are bad habits we have learned from the millennia of close proximity with the patriarchy. Nonetheless, like the little bird who intentionally and determinedly builds her nest in the face of an oncoming storm, and completes it before the thunder crashes across the skies, I too have come to know that the collective is my home, my place of belonging, where I find love, insights, wisdom, and friendship with my sisters in the struggle to retrieve our freedom. So thank you. I crafted the title of my presentation as an opportunity that is in resonance with the larger theme of the ASA this year. Without becoming eclipsed by the underlying masculinist and patriarchal assumptions which infuse the key notions of being, belonging, and becoming in relation to Africa. I've not heard much feminism or feminist discourse since I got here, in spite of encountering many predominantly black female persons in the corridors and seminar rooms. Some of us are probably asking ourselves this question. Has the Women's Caucus become a place of refuge and exclusion for women, such that men have been able to breathe a sigh of relief that we can let off steam in this little ghettoized space while they continue to lord over the real academic issues of African scholarship? From where I'm positioned as an outsider looking in, 
and I no longer traffic in the academy. I don't. I don't traffic in the academy. <laughs> it's toxic. And I want to live to 120 years. So I kind of bypass the toxicity when I can avoid it. But from where I'm positioned as an outsider looking in, the men around me seem to have a loose-limbed body language, <laughs> which signals a sense of ownership and ease with the status quo in ways similar or reminiscent to those of those of the entitled white males who dominated the ASA for decades and who eventually reluctantly yielded ground to black men after many exhausting battles over the ownership of what Africa is, will be, could be, and its myriad sensibilities. What then are the implications of not speaking our feminism in the central spaces of the ASA? Should we, as women who know the true realities of life on the African existential terrain and who are fully cognizant of the urgency of creating new ways of life and living, should we not be asking ourselves for how long we will be the audience to male blabber and often deeply reactionary and conservative discourses which reiterate the status quo everywhere Africans live and struggle. I hope that we will grasp this issue and call it out in our conversations. But my deliberate intention at being here is to shift the needle in the direction of a feminist energy that will make the long journey we have taken to get here worthwhile. So I'll be speaking to being radical, feminist, and belonging as women who are freedom seekers. In terms of the revisioning and redefinition of ourselves, our political and personal identities, and the necessary revolutionary work that we are engaged in as feminists everywhere we are located. Whatever feminist work we are doing, how and where we are engaged with it and in it, we must understand that we are part of a revolution. This is a contemporary imperative that must be met in order to respond effectively to the catastrophic implosion that is wrecking our lives everywhere across the planet. Feminism is a revolutionary process. It is serious political work it cannot be treated as a fad or a trend. And it requires courage, as our sister Maya Angelou insists, that we cannot go into the future without courage. That without courage, we cannot even begin to dream that we could live alternatively. It requires courage and the acquisition of continuous knowledge about the ways in which women everywhere have resisted the patriarchy since its inception at the moment of the creation of surplus. There is an extensive treasure trove of writing, speaking, documenting, performing, painting, singing, and living feminism, which every radical woman can and must draw, draw from so that she understands the enormity and the preciousness of naming herself radical and feminist. For me, feminism has been an often astoundingly difficult and exhilarating journey from which there can be no return to the conservatism and backwardness of patriarchal submissiveness and deference. It is a journey of self-discovery and of learning to love the parts of myself that I did not know I was. And so I want to lean into Audra and just echo her and use her to echo myself. 
Audra has said this about herself. She said, I'm still learning how to take joy from all the people I am, how to use all myself in the service of what I believe, how to accept when I fail and rejoice when I succeed. It is when we dare to be free and we perform that sense of being free that we connect with others around us. And Maha has already anticipated my little moment with the sister at the registration desk, <laughs> who asked me, what institution are you affiliated with? And I said, I don't do institutions, baby. I'm autonomous. And she was like, huh? And I said, yeah, she was taken aback because you know, the status quo is an established fact in most of our lives. And we wear the badges that declare which institution uh, defines our identities. And so after a short while of conversation with her about why we have to choose who we are and, and how we, we travel in the world, um, she very shyly said she loved the idea. And so I left with a feeling of pleasure that maybe I had cracked open a little window and pointed her in the direction of a vista where she could begin to imagine other parts of herself, of herself other selves that she is. So this and a myriad of other reasons makes naming ourselves feminist in the most radical ways essential to the task of freeing ourselves from the habits and strictures of patriarchal society. And that's why I, 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 I couched my, the title of my presentation today using these very core, powerful notions of being radical because we're here because we come from traditions of radical women and radical men, but particularly the radical women who pushed against the boundaries and who opened the pathways. And we have continued to widen those pathways and to ensure that they don't close behind us with every step that we take into the future present. So, this naming of ourselves is essential to the task of freeing ourselves so that we can imagine new worlds and alternative realities to the chaos and failure of patriarchy as capitalism, racism, homophobia, hatred, militarism, supremacy, and all the exclusions and denials which characterize the past millennium and beyond it. And I want to just spend a bit of time talking about being sentient and being human. And these are touchstones around some of the core issues that have been discussed in this meeting, but which really did not say anything about humans like me and you. Let me begin with being. Being is, after all, the reality from which we all emerge within the natural rhythms of the universe. Within nature, being is determined by the seemingly hidden and often unfathomable, unfathomable dimensions of life, living, and death. As humans, we must have, we must have started out across the planet in awe at the innumerable species which inhabited all the sites that make this an amazing place, seething with life. We were probably in the earlier moments of our existence on this planet. We were probably so much in awe of its immensity that we treaded cautiously among those who had come before us, the sentient beings who later became things to be hunted, slaughtered, 
tortured, terrorized, incarcerated, weighed and sold and discarded. Their destruction and extinction in many instances is still justified through supremacist creation myths and lies of divine providence tied to capitalist commodification and profit making, which continue to make the genocide of most other living beings normal. Many of us consider ourselves civilized for consuming their bodies every day as part of the performance of our superior achievement as humans. For the first half of my 67 years, I participated in the domestication, slaughter, preparation, and enjoyment of sentient bodies. My parents accumulated extensive wealth as the owners of butcheries and meat was a clear social statement that our household had arrived in class terms. Becoming vegan initiated one of the most powerful shifts in my life, enabling me to retrieve my sentience, the capacity to feel, perceive, and experience subjectivity, elements that are central to feminist consciousness and agency. That was when I realized just how immense the gap has become between us, the humans, and other living creatures and plants as things without feelings or consciousness in our perception and life. Let me repeat this message because it's so central to the revolutionary consciousness that we must acquire and cultivate in order to survive and thrive as women and as participants in an alternative humanist project. A sentient being, which includes humans, can feel, perceive, and sense things. They have an awareness of surroundings, sensations, thoughts, and an ability to show responsiveness. Having sense making, uh, excuse me, having sense makes something sentient or, or able to smell, communicate, touch, see, and hear. All sentient beings have an awareness of themselves they can feel happiness, sadness, pain, and fear. How often in the past three years have you heard someone express their horror at the realization that the regime in power has no empathy for other human beings and that Trump is inert of any human emotions besides a sense of entitled rage and contempt for most people? When the so-called migrant crisis was at its height, people were asking themselves, how could they do this? Put children in cages, snatch babies from the arms of terrified mothers, and scatter children across the length and breadth of this country to be lost forever, in many cases, to their parents and families. How could they build and extend walls across the southern border of this country, presumably to keep out disease-infested brown people because they do not belong in a space that has been marked white and male? A stolen, ecologically and socially devastated space where the native people remain hidden away in plain sight. This is the astounding arrogance of white capitalist patriarchy. These questions are deeply profound and necessary because this society has reached its nadir. From here on in, without a turnaround in another human-based direction, capitalism will take it over the cliff. That is inevitable for this society and every other place that has put profit at the center of its existence. But someone whispered to me conspiratorially that I should be cautious of the ways I speak while I'm here. Because, you know, Patricia, you're a troublemaker. And then I asked, and then I asked them, 
So what does democracy and freedom of speech mean to you then? I was reminding myself of what Audra had said, that your silence will not protect you. And being radical has always been about the courage to speak truth to power. So as one who honors the vegan life, I'm frequently asked the annoying question, so what do you eat? <laughs> so where does one begin to answer such a ridiculously ignorant question? Is it possible that so many humans have forgotten the immense largesse of nature's plant and fruit bounty and the meaning of food as nurturance and pleasure rather than as an expression of class privilege or dispossession, eating junk. In my search for wholeness, for a feminism that would enable me to thrive and continue to grow as an older woman who has become aware of her ability to connect with others in the ancient traditions of healing, which I do as part of my returning to the source in my community, to paraphrase Cabral and reinterpret him and embrace him and never let him go because he is so precious. Um, I also knew that the connectivity between women and the power of natural energy had been contemptuously declared in rational knowledge as a sign of inferiority and irrationality. Therefore, in the radical tradition of a non-conforming female, I set out to retrieve and reestablish my relationship with the other beings and with the land by crafting an alternative lifestyle based on a respect for all forms of life, which can be very irritating and also very delightful. The monkeys, we are in a drought in Southern Africa. It's a tremendous drought. People say, yeah, but you know, we've always had drought. We used to mark our ages by drought. We used to say, do you remember that drought that was so intense? Well, that's when my mother was born. And now the drought is another phenomenon. It's not part of the natural cycles of life. It's an artificial intrusion across our continent. And people are not prepared. We haven't taken the time to speak to the challenges of ecological destruction. And for me, because I live off and two acres of land, I grow most of my food, I make most of what I eat, and I learn every day what sufficiency means in lived terms. The drought has become an intimate partner, an intimate force in my life. And I feel helpless. I'm unable to respond. It's, it's treacherous because it, it delivers storms that are totally destructive. It's, you know, you can see the land becoming bleached and leached and losing its life force. And so, <clears throat> learning to live in new ways is clearly very difficult. And I understand why so many of us don't want to even entertain the possibility. I'm not speaking about becoming farmers. I'm speaking about taking yourself to a new place and thinking about the alternative ways of doing the political work. The work that will make feminism a hegemonic force in the, in the true sense that Gramsci coined the notion of hegemony. As a force of liberation 
rather than the ways in which it has, the, that term has been appropriated and used, particularly in the US Academy, to empower the ruling forces, to speak of hegemony as dominance by those who occupy the state, who control the resources of the societies that we live in. But that's not the Kramchian meaning of hegemony. He really was speaking about the force of revolution, the force of freedom, the love for freedom, which drives the, the possibilities of creating new ways of being and of living. So I've negotiated with all the little creatures who live around me, including a mamba, which is about one and a half meters. And the other day, she, I think about all the creatures around me as she's, because I'm thinking of them <laughs> as a feminist community. So the birds are she's and the lizards are she's. You know, okay, the guys are there, but along the periphery. And, and so I've negotiated with them, but I know I am not a fool. And I know that the mamba can kill me within 10 minutes of her bite. But I also refer to them as ba, a prefix which humanizes in the Siswati language. And I often encounter raised eyebrows among my neighbors but I know what I'm doing by recognizing the being of sentience, particularly in a cruel society that has become cold, brutal, repressive, and deeply unkind to anyone who's not male, and even to many males. The point of all of this telling is to return subjectivity to feminism as a critical resource in revisioning our identities and political discourses. This is something we fought hard for from the very beginning of our conceptualization and theorization of feminism as an ideology of freedom and as a political tool of resistance and struggle for wholeness, for social inclusions, and in resisting particular, the, particularly the vicious exclusionary feudal cultures that pervade our communities and the lives of African women. And I'm going to end with discussing feudalism because this for me, is the mountain that awaits us. This is the mountain that we have to move. The great stone, as the sisters of the Caribbean put it. We have to roll this stone out of the way. It's a massive boulder that is preventing us from becoming the amazingly incredible, beautiful humans that we are on that continent called home for all humans. But I want to touch Baldwin for a minute. James Baldwin, that much missed beloved. And he put it this way. He said, the place in which I will fit will not exist until I make it. Being complete, vibrant, and free women has to become central to the notion of African being beyond the spaces of the ASA and the Academy on and off the continent. We cannot begin to make the real difference in the quality and essence of our lives as radical women unless we become uncompromising about the entitlements of all living beings to be treated with the same respect and dignity that we demand for ourselves. We have to intentionally disrupt and rupture the systems, structures, rhetorical and discursive mechanisms and practices that stand between us and the freedom to be whole. The ties that bind us to, freedom of, to the freedom of other beings are wrought in the bloodied and brutalized bodies of countless women across the landscapes of the planet and of our continent. And Sylvia Federici reminds us through a courageous work on witch hunts and the rampancy of misogyny and sexual impunity across our worlds that capitalism and feudalism battled for power and survival on the bodies and in the lives of women. Primitive accumulation, that necessary uncorking of the capitalist genie called the fetish, 
was inevit inevitably about herding and corralling women and their reproductive and creative capacities into sites of exploitation and surveillance at the behest of ruling class men of all colors across the societies of the planet. And as Federici explains, the advent of the capitalist mode of production dependent on a vicious and violent misogyny, just as it relied on land enclosure, trade expansion, colonialism, and slavery. Misogyny helped give birth to the modern world, and that modern world was extended to Africa through its incorporation into the imperial global system of capitalism. That project, initiated through the colonial encounter in its modern form, had long begun, had long since begun across the, the societies of the continent, where feudal hierarchies and practices of exploitation and cultural constructions of the female body as filthy, dangerous, in need of male control and ownership, and not to be trusted outside the male gaze, had served as the foundation stones for a patriarchal system that simply colluded with white patriarchy at the moment of colonial intervention. Many have been angered, and I, I know I probably am upsetting someone now, but that's okay. You know, uh, we have to learn to listen to each other, and then we take the gift if it uh, gives us happiness or insight, or we leave it on the table and we walk away. It's a choice. Many have been angered by my insistence that patriarchy is homegrown in every society that survived beyond the hunting and gathering stage. And white patriarchy merely reinforced the feudal strictures and shackles that already bound women to deeply unequal and often life-taking practices in all our African societies. So why do so many African women continue to defend feudal patriarchal practices and even participate in them as an ex expression of their identities and sense of belonging to Africa? Why is there no critical feminist genre of theoretical and activist work on the notion and systems of feudalism when they are performed and paraded in plain sight. The chiefs and the kings seated on thrones, lugged by working people who humble themselves and genuflect before these pre-capitalist demigods. The pride with which so many Africans declare their statuses as royals and aristocrats, even as they enjoy the spoils of plunder and pillage of the national resources of our societies. Why have we, who name ourselves feminists, and who even sometimes name ourselves radical, why have we been so afraid to critique the persistence of feudalism as the mainstay of patriarchal infrastructure, which keeps the majority of African women enslaved and excluded from the minimal benefits of the neo-colonial state dispensation. After all, women have been demanding the rights of all females since the initial encounter with colonialism and settler racist intrusion into our continent. We participated in the liberation struggles we insisted, we even took our clothes off in the public in many instances, right? And the anthropologists love those moments. Huh? And yet, we allow the feudalism to keep the majority of us holed up in distant places where we have no access to even the most minimal protections that are supposed to be guaranteed by states that tax us and that just plunder the natural resources that belong to all of us. So why then do we shy away from the necessary critique of the most pernicious patriarchal system which most of us have encountered and been brutalized by through humiliating social cultural experiences 
of becoming female. I remember the women in the family when I was a child telling me to keep my legs together. Keep it hidden away. It's a monster, it's a nunu, a shishi. Separating me from the most powerful zones in my body and teaching me that my body belongs to someone else. That is just simply egregious. And we call it culture. We continue to defend it and to participate in it. We write the fancy books and then we go home for the holidays. And we wear the cloth around our waists and we genuflect in front of the men. We put the dish of water in front of them so they can wash their hands and feel their manhood and eat the biggest pieces of meat. And we reproduce the feudalism, the feudal patriarchy. And at the end of Sunday afternoon, we get into our cars and we drive back to the city and we become professors, feminist professors and gender experts. Why are we doing it? Because I know we are courageous. Let me tell you, there are no women who are fiercer than African women. Regardless of where we have lived on this continent, ask those who, who faced the wrath of black women in this country. The Fannie Lou Hammers, huh? the Rosa Parks, and a myriad, I mean, millions and millions of women who have stood up and said and put, put our fingers in the face of patriarchal arrogance and said, you cannot do that to me. But we continue to protect the feudalism, the feudal patriarchy in all our societies. We've encountered it on our bodies through the hatred of ourselves that is manifest in the mutilation of our genitalia and other forms of sexual bodily violation through persistent family practices that exclude and discriminate against us at all ages of our lives as female beings, through the sexual impunity which underpins the spiraling rates of femicide and misogynistic brutality and hatred we encounter on the streets, in the workplaces, in intimate relationships, as queer Africans, as disabled and non-conforming Africans. Why is there such a screaming silence about these outrageously unacceptable practices which have safeguarded the privilege and accumulation of wealth of black ruling class males everywhere on our continent through a collusion between those embedded in feudal systems and those who are situated in the neocolonial state, each enabling the other to maintain a brutal and inequitous, iniquitous status quo. I'm aware of the humps in our path that white anthropologists and gender specialists, some of whom are black, have placed in front of our attempts to speak for ourselves. I'm aware of that. In the academy, there are those who specialize on us. Yeah. It's a business. I'm also aware of the persistent hold that funders and donors have from within and outside the academy over the content and direction of research work that many African feminist scholars attempt to undertake. And I am also cognizant of the power that people who have control over resources, social, economic, and political, and otherwise, the power that they can exert upon another human being especially if playing safe and not rattling the academic cage seems to be the only option one has when you're so far away from home, a home that no longer provides us with possibilities for a, a viable future. However, bowing and scraping has never freed anyone. 
being beholden to someone because he, as an African male head of department, can bring your burgeoning academic career to a screeching halt and make your life hell in every conceivable way, huh? being beholden only serves to create a servile and mediocre class of people whose creative energies and dreams are strangled by the lack of courage to stand up and make a dignified life for themselves. It's hard, it's very hard to stare right back at the patriarchy and fight against the backlash, which is often swift and merciless. I know it, and I also know that I was able to survive the misogynistic hatred, often alone, because I had, to, had come to consciousness that no one can take my life. Okay, they can kill me, but they can't take my life unless I allow them to. Finding the place where you can imagine, craft and live your contemporary feminism and bring the value of your radical agency to making the shift towards the alternative for humankind is where it's at, as Nina Simone would have put it. That's where it's at. Finding the place where you can imagine, craft and live your contemporary feminism, the way it, it jibes with you, the way it works for you, the way it makes it happen for you. Hmm? And bring the value of that to this massive attempt, this massive effort that is underway everywhere in our world to create an alternative for all humankind. That's where it's at. Challenging and dismantling feudalism is, for me, one of the most urgent feminist imperatives facing us as radical women across our continent. We have to set out on an intellectual and activist project to interrogate and expose the pernicious relationships that I've just described. We have to demand that the civil state be extended to every corner of our social landscapes, and that those who are paid by our taxes must be accountable to us as the citizens of our societies. We must dema demand that the disgraceful and degrading practices of farming out people with mental illness who are shackled and tortured, that it must be criminalized and that the state must be held responsible for such dehumanizing practices. We have to see the links between the enslavement of young females in shrines and in the households of older males in exchange for a pittance as a direct connection to the persistence of feudal systems and fraudulent neocolonial regi regimes that pretend that such barbarism is culture. We know that these colonial re regimes deliberately sustain the feudal infrastructures because they are very effective mechanisms for the control and surveillance over working people, especially over women. That's why they keep them. That's why they entrench them in their parliaments. There's your great South Africa, which is supposedly the most advanced constitution in the world, isn't it? They boast about it. And they re-entrenched the feudal system, the chiefs, and the kings. Why? Why? At the moment of independence, when they could have actually taken their society in a different direction, they brought these ancient fixtures and revitalized them. And they paid them huge amounts of money to function as shepherds, herding the people and controlling them along the margins of the society. And that's what we have to resist. That's what we have to theorize. That's what we have to challenge. And that's what we have to change. Because otherwise, everything we are doing is for naught. We're not getting, gonna go anywhere when the majority of us are left outside, are unable to access 
the most basic, basic discursive spaces and protections, the things that we struggle for all our lives to protect the humans, the female humans in particular. Huh? And they never reach any of those protections. And we are frustrated as activists, as intellectuals. But we know why the majority of women don't have access to their rights. We know. So now we have to find the courage to resolve the problem. It is only after we're able to disrupt this cozy relationship between these two sets of elites that we'll begin to respond to the widespread brutalization of humans, of people in our societies, to work on policies that extend the civil, technological, and material infrastructures of the state to every person, regardless of where they are located, and to bring the legal and civil protections that are entitlements into the lived realities of all Africans. Um, I'm going to stop now because I, I, I would like us to have 15 minutes, but I'm just going to, to conclude by saying that we're also faced by this tremendous, tremendous psychological crisis across our continent. The majority of Africans don't believe that they have a future. The majority of us have been so hammered into the ground by exclusion, economic exclusion through structural adjustment. Now they're moving us off the land and s selling it to multinational corporations who are growing beautiful organic food for European uh, consumers and Americans who can afford it. And, our, and more and more, we have less and less to work with. And the conservatives are riding this tailwind of deep-seated disillusionment. And the people don't believe that those in the state can make a difference for them. As Cabral said, we must always remember that the people are not interested in the ideas that we have in our heads. They want to see the difference in their lives. They want their children to survive. They want to become grandparents and to experience the joy of longevity and to experience the comfort and the ease of the resources that belong to us that are being plundered even right now and taken to other societies. That's where the challenge is. And the right wing is riding that, that wind, that tailwind. And they're fueling the homophobia and the hatred of alternative identities of sexuality and otherwise, e everything that stands for a future, they're trampling it into the ground. And we cannot collude with that. We have to challenge it and connect it with the fact that we are the ones who have the key. We're the ones who can speak truth to that infamy. So therefore, I know I'm raising deeply complex and convoluted challenges, but I think that uh, it is a time, a wonderful time to be alive, and it's an even better time to be radical. So to conclude, I'd like to share a gem from Edward Said, whose beautiful Palestinian mind and heart I miss terribly. And I miss Cabral too, as I've already said for his genuine love of working people and his incisive and prescient radical intellect from which I've drawn so much inspiration and pleasure over the years. But Edward reminds us in a scathing critique of anti-intellectualism and in a scathing critique of the narrowness of nationalism where we point each other out 
you are not as African enough as I am. And we revert to a revengeist ethnicity that is vicious and destructive and which disrupts the project of the alternative. And he, he reminds us that people and schools of criticism, ideas and theories travel from person to person, from situation to situation, from one period to another. Cultural and intellectual life are usually nourished and often sustained by the circulation of ideas. And that this is what it means to be an intellectual, to recognize the, uh, the trove of wealth that radical humans who love freedom have created for us is an inheritance that is more precious than wealth. And so, I wish you all a fabulously radical future present. Dip your intellectual tongue into the deep well of feminist knowledge across all human societies and grow the span of your gorgeous feminist wings so that you can fly past the jealous patriarchal sun and dance with our mother, the moon, and have fulfilling and sufficient radical female lives. Thank you. I'm sorry I used up all the time, but maybe we have five minutes. I see people are already moving out, but uh, I don't know the man. I mean, ugh, the language is so male, managers. <laughs> Androcentricity. But otherwise, you know what? Let's just leave it. We've had pleasure. And you know, yeah, let's spread our wings and fly. Yeah. <laughs> you have we have we have a few minutes before we, you have we are something. kicked. No, we are kicked out of the room. Okay. So we're going to just do a few introductions. Yes. Yes. But yeah. we want to tell you, please tell people that they can talk to you outside. Yeah, they yeah. know that. For those of you who are still around, uh, Dr. Patricia McFadden will still be here for those who want to say hi to her and if you have any questions. But we have a few minutes left before we wrap up and we wanted to introduce the wonderful and fabulous new Women's Caucus co convener So I'll let Maha do that. Everybody, um, before we leave, I want to introduce um, my co-convener, um, who is Anita Plummer, and uh, <laughs> I am very grateful to Anita for being so gracious and open to working with me and to being part of the caucus. I'm very excited about what lays ahead. So. Let me tell you a little bit about Anita. She's an assistant professor of African studies at Howard University. Her research and teaching focus on African political economy, transnationalism, public diplo diplomacy, and Sino-African rela relations. Her articles on China's engagement in Africa have been published in the National Political Science Review, the Journal of Asian and African Studies, Africa, the Africa Focus Bulletin, and Foreign Policy in Focus. She was a visiting assistant professor at Spelman College and the University of California, Los Angeles, and was a pre-doctoral fellow at the Carter G. Woodson Center Institute at the University of Virginia. 
In addition to her work in academia, Anita has a passion for social justice, community organizing, and international solidarity. For the past 20 years, she has worked with various community-based organizations in California and Maryland, working on climate justice, housing issues, youth empowerment, and ending gun violence. She serves as a coordinating committee member of the US Africa Network and an executive committee member for the South region of the American Friends Service Committee. So please join me in welcoming Anita Plummer to the Women's Caucus. And before we conclude the luncheon, we just wanted to thank those who have supported Maha and I over the year and have offered their wise advice as well as mentorship. We wanted to start off by thanking members of the steering committee, if you're here, if you could please stand up and give you a round of, of uh, applause. We also wanted to thank the members of the advisory committee who have often uh, mentored us and offered advice during our, our year. And if you're here, if you could please stand up. I know I saw Judith, Kathleen, thank you. And of course, we wanted to thank the various individuals who served on the Women's Caucus Committees and those who worked really closely with Maha and I, Alicia, our membership uh, secretary, and Tara, who I believe is somewhere out there, who served as our treasurer. And last but not least, we must give our great and very deep thanks to the ASA administration for always supporting the Women's Caucus. First, Susan Bassett, who always supported us in our endeavors. I don't know if she's here in the audience, but she's stepping down at the, as the ASA Executive uh, Director. But we just wanted to, egg, to egg acknowledge her great support for the Women's Caucus. Laurieann Chidire, who went above and beyond to always help us find funding and to do whatever she could to help us. And of course, Alex Saba. So we just wanted to thank them as well. And I just wanted to make a quick note for those of you who would like to always know what's going on with the Women's Caucus and our activities, please join the list, the, the listserv, and the person that you can contact is Alicia Decker, our membership secretary. And as for me, it's been a very big pleasure being the lead co convener for this year. The Women Caucus has meant a lot to me since I was in graduate school. I would not be the scholar, mentor, in person if it wasn't for the Women's Caucus. And I look forward to Maha and to Anita leading the way. Thank you. So just a quick word. Um, Jackie, thanks everyone who has been working with us, but I want to give a big thanks and a shout out to Jackie for the incredible work she has done this year and for her work ethic and commitment to the Women's Caucus. Woo! Thank you, and we are expected to be leaving the room in a couple of minutes. Um, so thank you everybody and have a good rest of the day and the conference.